you, Sangeeta. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone at ACD. Um, so we're very basic scientists uh, in the Schleibach lab. We, we are interested kind of in membrane protein biophysics and how, how proteins fold. And as someone coming from that background, the kind of conferences that we go to are usually lots of academics who are you know, obsessed with very academic problems. And to come to a conference like this where I can meet patients, I just have to say that you inspire us and it's very motivating for us to be here, so thanks. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to use this. So in, like I was sort of saying, our background is really in sort of membrane protein biophysics. And we're really interested in how membrane proteins fold and the coupling between folding and trafficking to the cell surface. So this is important in the context of diseases because what's weird is that membrane proteins, and in, and in fact all proteins um, in the body, and these are the molecular machines that sort of do everything, they, the cell makes them, but it doesn't tend, evolution doesn't tend to optimize that very much. And so even wild type proteins, what we call wild type, they don't traffic efficiently. Um, like we study a number of different systems, we study like the protein involved in cystic fibrosis, um, the one involved in retinitis pigmentosa that can cause night blindness. And we've looked at the trafficking efficiency for a bunch of wild type proteins. And it's low. Like most of them, only 50% um, get to the membrane. And then when you add a mutational variant on top of that, it just makes them accumulate in the endoplasmic reticulum where they're synthesized. And they, they very rarely get to the cell surface. And this is exactly sort of the problem that we have in uh, CTD. So in CTD, you know, you start out with a, a protein that has only marginal trafficking efficiency, and then you add a mutation to it, and it just really pushes that trafficking even lower. And for a protein to function, it has to get to the cell, for a membrane protein to function, one that brings in creatine from outside the cell into a neuron, it has to get to the cell membrane. Um, and in cystic fibrosis research, you know, they found that some of the variants, like if you actually stop the quality control machinery of the cell from degrading the protein before it's made, um, and you just let it traffic, sometimes these um, proteins that are marginally stable still function. And so we're looking for a corrector for a lot of these variants. And to do that, we need to push the trafficking efficiency up. Um, and you know, we use a lot of techniques in our lab, and flow cytometry is sort of one of our bread and butters. We had this paper, I think it was 2019, and basically what you're looking at there are some distributions of trafficking, of trafficking, and each sort of, you can't see the dots, it's like a density plot. And if you could see the raw data, they would, they would be a bunch of dots, and each dot is a cell. And what we're, we, we stain for both plasma membrane, we have a plasma membrane stain for the creatine transporter, and we have an intracellular stain for the creatine transporter. And you can see that here we have like two different variants. You can see that this variant G466R, you know, sort of accumulates intracellularly, whereas the wild type, more of it gets to the cell membrane. And if you plot, like this is a group of eight different variants. Uh, you can see wild type, you know, what, we're, what the axes here are plasma membrane expression on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis is basically we measure the uptake of creatine. And you can see that wild type has both good uptake and good trafficking. There's this other variant, M560V, that has a little bit less uptake, um, but, but it still traffics. And then we have you know, these two weird outliers that fall off the diagonal that have almost no uptake, but they have pretty decent trafficking. So figuring out what kind of variants you know, break function directly, we, these two variants right here, G421R, um, so and P382L, this G421R is thought to actually exist in the creatine binding site of the protein. And so when you put this arginine mutation in here, arginine is a really big amino acid, and glycine is a really little one. That's the sort of wild type amino acid. So when you put this arginine in the pocket where creatine is supposed to go, it just doesn't fit. And then this P382L, proline is like a very special amino acid that causes kinks to form in helices. It's sort of and it's thought that this sort of kink that forms actually can plug uh, the creatine transporter and, and sort of protect the substrate from the rest of the solvent as it sort of transitions to the inward facing state. So this is another one that's critical to the sort of the trend, you know, the 
conformational cycle of the creatine transporter, and so it sort of breaks function directly. These other, this cluster of other um, residues, and it's thought that they all have very poor trafficking, and it's probably the case that their, their poor trafficking efficiency is why they have such low uptake. And if we could just get these to actually traffic, then maybe we could have some function too. <clears throat> And you know, it turns out that up to 80% of pathogenic variants um, across all di like genetic diseases are probably involve some kind of folding defect. So we want to find a way to basically improve the trafficking efficiency. And that means that we need to find a way to stabilize the native fold of the protein. And it turns out that you know, some small molecules, when they bind to a protein and they stay there for a long time, that can actually sort of stabilize the native fold. And sort of what you can see here, these are a bunch of drugs that Vertex came out with in the last 10 years for cystic fibrosis. And um, this has really revolutionized cystic fibrosis research. Uh, there's, there's a specific variant called Delta F508. It sounds very similar to Delta F408 that we have in CTD, but it's a totally different protein. Uh, that one actually, this is the one that I was referring to earlier, that if you could just get it to traffic, um, it could function, and we also have allosteric modulators for CFTR. These are called potentiators, and they can actually open the channel a little bit more. So what we need are drugs that both can chaperone the protein to get to the cell surface, and maybe also allosteric modulators for the creatine transporter for those variants that sort of have broken function, um, but still traffic okay. <clears throat> so. You know, our other very closely related proteins, is there a pathway forward with this? Well, sort of, um, I think a, a research group in Toronto, I, forgive me that I can't remember his name, they looked at this in the context of the dopamine transporter. These are the panels on the right. Um, and on panels on the left, this is, these are people, uh, Michael Freesmith and Sonny Suchek at Vienna looked at this in the context of the serotonin transporter. Now, the dopamine transporter and serotonin transporter are very close homologs. In other words, they're very closely related to the creatine transporter. They behave similarly. They have similar sort of architectures of their protein structure. And you can, it's kind of hard to see in the light, but, you know, there's, there's this pair of mutations, um, 601PG602. So it's like two neighboring amino acids, I think. Um, and there's like a mutation, basically. And when you have, this is basically a pathogenic variant for the serotonin transporter that impedes trafficking of the serotonin transporter. And when you treat this with, they had this series of drugs that came out of the Research Triangle Institute. They were looking at these. And when you, when you add this drug, they're sort of, they're atypical substrates for the serotonin transporter. They actually, what you see on, on the far right there is you have, you know, increased trafficking to the cell membrane. So you can sort of see it's diffuse on the left panel, and then on the right when you add the drug, um, nor ibogaine in this case, you actually get, you know, more localization of the creatine transporter at the interfaces between the cells. That means that it's more of it's going to the membrane. Um, and on the right, these panels are looking at the same thing in the context of the dopamine transporter. So there's atypical substrates, you know, the dopamine transporter and serotonin transporter, these are the targets for things like, you know, SSRIs um, and antipsychotics and other like sort of drugs of, you know, neuropsychology interest. And um, some of them, like noribogaine and it turns out Welbutrin, which is also an atypical, you know, uh, inhibitor of the dopamine transporter and the serotonin transporter, these can increase trafficking to the cell membrane for a couple of variants that actually cause people to have very low dopamine transporter expression. Um, and so this was sort of like a roadmap for us for thinking about creatine transporter and how we can use, can we find basically drugs that are like Welbutrin, you know, that can be used against the creatine transporter? And you know, what's the common mechanism of action? Not like most Prozac doesn't increase the expression of the serotonin transporter, uh, but Welbutrin does. So how does that work? What makes it different? It turns out that these drugs are a little bit different than SSRIs and other psychostimulants in that they stabilize the inward-facing conformation of the serotonin transporter. So these transporters, and this is an, that was an X-ray crystal structure that showed how noribogaine sits in the, in the serotonin transporter. It's really important to understand sort of the conformational cycle of these. They're alternating access, you know, they use an alternating access mechanism to uptake creatine, you know, from the outside of the cell 
to the inside. So at one stage of the cycle, they're facing sort of the outside of the cell. And as Dr. Baker was talking about earlier, this is all a sodium-driven process. Across the cell membrane, there's a really strong sodium gradient. And energetically, this is what helps drive the you know, intake of substrates from outside the cell into the inside of the cell. It's basically the desire of, ser of sodium to get into the cell. And the trans these transporters are a way to do that. Um, so it's thought that most um, drugs, most inhibitors like SSRIs that target these SLC6 transporters stabilize the outward facing conformation. But what makes sort of noribogaine and Wellbutrin unique is that they can bind to and stabilize the inward facing conformation. And you know, in the compartment of the cell where you know, these proteins are synthesized, the ER, they don't have a sodium gradient across them. So it's thought, you know, there's a, this is all speculation, some of the speculation that Michael, Michael Friesmith has done, but it's thought that maybe something about the lack of a sodium gradient in the ER means that when these, you know, that in the ER, these proteins primarily adopt the inward facing conformation, because it's thought that sodium sort of locks them into the outward facing conformation. And so that's why noribogaine, for example, might lock this, might help it chaperone to the cell surface, because it binds and it binds stably. Um, so can we find a, a drug like this for the creatine transporter um, that stably you know, interacts with the inward facing permeation pathway? And so unfortunately, there's no sort of experimental structures available of the creatine transporter. But you know, we know a lot about the structure of these SLC6 transporters in general from many studies that have been done over the years. These are you know, like the monoamine neurotransmitter transporters are of great sort of interest to the pharmaceutical industry, for example. Um, and it turns out that there's a lot of sort of overlap between the structure of all the major biogenic amine transporters. And it's thought that subsequently they've, they've looked at like the glycine transporter, and it has a similar architecture. So we can be pretty calm in, you know, the first structure of an SLC6 transporter ever was actually an amino acid transporter uh, from bacteria. So we built some homology models um, based on, you know, many of these templates that exist because we specifically wanted confirmations of the transporter in the inward facing state and the outward facing state. The idea there is that we can sort of develop a virtual screen against the inward facing state and then use the outward facing state as sort of a counter screen. And so that's kind of what we did. We sort of first benchmarked this approach by looking at some known inhibitors of the creatine transporter. Well, not just inhibitors, but things that just are known to, well, you know, we have, you know, data on their binding affinity. And, you know, some of these are probably well known to people in the audience, um, including this uh, three guanidine or propionate. Uh, creatine, of course, is on the list. And there's, there's several other compounds. And what you can see there that's in interesting is, you know, how much they actually inhibit uptake of creatine. This is old work that was done by Randy Blakely back in, I think, the 90s. So we have good data on metabolites that can bind to these transporters. And so, you know, we sort of, I, my role in the lab is we deal with lots of big data, and so I do a lot of sort of machine learning and computational chemistry modeling and stuff like that. The person that's done the real work in our lab is Jackie on this project, and she's going to help, hopefully help me answer questions at the end, because she deserves to. Um, but this part of the work is sort of all computational, this sort of pilot study. And so we sort of docked creatine and ATPCA, which is another substrate um, to the creatine transporter. And then we use sort of a machine learning approach to estimate their binding free energy. That's basically how strongly these different drugs bind to different targets. And then we compare, it's very simple, we compare the binding affinity to the inward facing state, the binding affinity to the outward facing state, and we can calculate like a bias score. And you know these substrates have, in our model at least, very minimal bias, which is what you would expect. You think that substrates are going to bind pretty equally well to both the outward and the inward facing state, whereas inhibitors uh, like 3 guanidino propionate, um, 3 guanidino butyrate, they have you know much more strong biases to the outward facing state. And then if you look at all those drugs, we you know metabolites, and look at their their you know their effect on creatine transporter activity versus um, this bias score that we came up with. You can see that the things with um, that have an inward facing confirmation bias don't really block the transport cycle. And then things that do, you can see that they have a much lower um, activity. You know, they, in other words, they block sort of the activity of the creatine transporter.
In other words, the active as inhibitors. It's important that if we're looking for a drug that binds the creatine transporter in order to get it to function at the cell membrane, obviously we don't want to inhibit it. <laughs> so that was important. Um, so yeah, this is basically our virtual screen, screening strategy is to sort of dock a bunch of compounds to the outward facing state and a bunch to the inward facing state. Um, and our compound of interest should be you know, one that really stabilizes that inward facing state according to this hypothesis. Now once we get a compound, we don't really care how it works. This is just basically the whole point of this hypothesis driven way to, do, to, de to design a virtual screen is to just you know, in stack the deck in our favor of getting something that works. Uh, so we looked at a bunch of different compounds um, from something called the Zinc database. This is a database with millions of compounds that you can use for virtual screens. And we sort of trimmed down the size of it by looking specifically for creatine analogs. And analogs that, basically these are compounds that either had creatine or 3 guanadinopropionate within their, within their structure. In other words, like there's a bunch of other gingerbread around it, but they all, if you like look in it, if you look at these structures, uh, you might recognize creatine in there somewhere. Um, so that was kind of the idea. We had about 8,000 of these to start with. And, um, you know, we, if you look at the structure of noribogaine and its relationship to dopamine, you can kind of see dopamine in there, and then there's this sort of cage around it that sort of extends down, and it's thought that maybe something about the structure is what stabilizes the inward-facing state of the dopamine transporter. That's kind of what we wanted with this. We wanted compounds that kind of acted like creatine, but then had a bunch of gingerbread that would sort of wedge into the intracellular permeation pathway and kind of lock it open. And that's kind of what we see, at least in these models. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing that we did was we looked for drugs that had sort of, you know, log Ps. So log P is basically just a measure of how, um, you know, if you take water and oil and you take uh, some substance and let it pick whether it wants to be in water or oil, log P is basically the amount that it chooses either water or oil. Uh, and drugs, we want drugs to usually have very, you know, a range, especially lead compounds, a range of log P's so that when we do further medicinal chemistry on it, that log P tends to get higher. In other words, it gets more hydrophobic. And so you want to kind of be careful about that. There's also questions related to the blood-brain barrier with this. But that's all like for way down the line. So we, in our initial virtual screen, we got, you know, a number of compounds, I think 50, that had good bias scores. And what we want, what you're looking at here is basically just, you know, the binding free energy, the calculated binding free energy for the inward facing state and for the outward facing state. And what we want are compounds up in this quadrant, things that, you know, bind very weakly and the more positive the number, the more weak the binding. Things that bind very weakly to the outward facing state but very favorably to the inward facing state. What we don't want are compounds in this quadrant, things that bind very poorly to the inward facing state but very well to the outward facing, or yeah, very well to the outward facing state. And so this is sort of where we left off two years ago when I gave this talk. Um, and we start, we had like 55 compounds that we were excited about. And what we were gonna do is we were gonna take those 55 compounds and then look for analogs of those. In other words, we're sort of exploring chemical space and trying to find um, candidates for leads that we can sort of start with. And what you're looking at here is basically just, you know, a measure of this delta delta G um, it's basically this bias score, and the more negative it is, the better. And that's kind of the 55 compounds. We had two different virtual screens. It doesn't really matter what these two different virtual screens are. Let's call them the OF screen and the IF screen. Um, and these sort of wings of this are basically, these are kind of distributions of scores for both you know, the outward facing state and the inward facing state. Outward facing state in blue and inward facing state in red. And as you can see, this IF screen on the right um, had, they had really good scores for the inward facing state. In other words, they were very negative, but less, less negative for the outward facing state. And that's good. Um, so in that second generation com like screen, we were able to sort of enrich the number of compounds that we had in this correct quadrant, um, and we had 136 results. And so then we were like, okay, let's source these. So we tried to source them commercially, and the company that we worked with was Enamine, but this, we were doing this at the time, enamine is located in Ukraine, um, and it was difficult for us to get compounds from enamine at the time. So we found another company called ChemSpace, and ChemSpace was able to find like 53 compounds that were either identical to some of these 136, or they were extremely close analogs. And so these 53 compounds, 
I redocked those, um, tested them, made sure that they looked similar to the compounds that fell off of our initial screens, and you can see the distribution of bias scores looks pretty good. It looks very similar to our compounds that we identified in our initial screen. So now we have compounds um, that all fell out of a computational chemistry approach. Now we want to see if they do things in the real world. And so this is where Jackie came in. Um, and Haritha is working with Jackie on a lot of these experiments. And as I sort of mentioned earlier, we're using flow cytometry, where we have, we have these cells, these HEK293 T cells, also that I think Dr. Baker was talking about those. And what we can do is, you know, find cells using flow cytometry that have our creatine transporter, like, um, expressed, um, because we also uh, express GFP with those. It's not a fusion, but it's co-expressed. And so we can use this GFP signal to track where the creatine transporter cells are, and we can take these and apply our two stains. So we stain them. We have an, uh, a stain for the outside, you know, basically membrane-bound creatine transporter. Our, our creatine transporter constructs have an HA tag, and we use that HA tag to be recognized by an antibody that's very good against the HA tag. And that antibody contains our fluorophores that we stain for. And so first we stain the outside of the cell, then we fix and permeabilize those cells, and then stain for intracellular creatine transporter. Um, and all this work, by the way, I just want to point out, is done in the context of wild type. And that's why I spent some time at the beginning justifying the fact that this is a good place to start because we know that a good pharmacochaperone is going to boost wild type expression too. We have a bank of about 30 variants in the freezer that Jackie next week or sometime this summer is going to start working on actual variants. But what we see here is here we have all that this is, these squares are basically just compounds. And you know the red squares are compounds that have increased stain signal, and the blue ones are ones that have decreased stain signal relative to DMSO treatment. DMSO was the vehicle that we used for the drug. Um, and so the important thing to look for here is we have an internal stain and a surface stain. And we have one compound in the surface stain that is glowing bright red. And this is exactly what we want. Uh, we want compound that um, you know, increases surface expression without necessarily decreasing total expression. And so that's sort of, if you look at this bar graph on the left here, um, we're looking at three different compounds. And one, C4, that's the middle blue bar, the darker blue bar. This is the compound that we think is promising. You can see that if we look at surface stain, it goes up relative um, to DMSO, um, whereas the other two compounds either don't do anything or they go down. One thing that we saw in some earlier studies that we did was we would increase total expression. And that's what you can see in this compound C1. Um, the internal stain goes up compared to DMSO, but if you look at its surface stain, it's not that high. So the good thing about this compound C4 is that it actually does what we want it to do. And then these on the right are just sort of histograms showing you know, the raw data, showing that when you add DMSO, you have um, one distribution of of cellular stains, and then when you add our compound C4, it pushes this to the right. And even though they, they look like they overlap a lot, but this is a log scale. This is actually um, a pretty significant effect. And so looking at this compound, um, we view this as sort of a lead compound. Obviously, there's a lot of work that we need to do on this, but it has a pretty good log P. It's on the high side, um, so it might not be ideal for doing further medicinal chemistry. but you know, this is a good start at least. And it kind of, you know, thinking about this, looking at the doc structure of it, it sort of is in keeping with our hypothesis. You have this, these bulky chemical groups um, and it sort of, you know, goes in, it sort of snakes into that intracellular permeation pathway that you can see. Um, and then we have, so just as sort of a peak here, this is literally right a hot off the presses. This is sort of our first functional um, study that we looked at with this. And basically, these bars are percentages of uh, creatine reuptake. And again, this is all in the context of wild type. But the important thing to keep in mind here is if it goes above zero, that's good. Um, and if it goes below zero, that you know, is bad. Uh, what zero is is DMSO treatment. And so you can see that untreated, obviously, you know, is below the DMSO even. So DMSO has an effect. DMSO, it turns out, can boost the amount of reuptake of creatine that you get. Um, but then looking at these other compounds, they're at least positive. So what we can say is that these compounds at least are not, um, we can't really say for sure how, whether, how strong these effects are. Because this is fresh data, this has to be replicated. 
Um, this is, that's why there's no error bars. Uh, but we thought that this was cool enough that we would share it with you guys. And what you can see is that these compounds are doing something and they're not acting as inhibitors. So that's good, at least with this first replicate. And so in the future, obviously what we want to do is look further on you know, the effects on creatine transporter activity with these compounds. We want, to do, we want to take this lead compound that looks interesting and maybe do further virtual screens based on it. Um, and the most importantly, and this is, I've been wanting to do this for a very long time, we need to see how this acts towards our, our pool of variants that we have. Um, because our lab's you know, whole thing is that we're able to look at lots of different variants simultaneously using these high throughput experiments that we have. And so that's where this gets really cool. And then we've actually uh, been talking to a medicinal chemist at Purdue, uh, Dan Flaherty, and he's sort of thrown in his hat and said that he would be willing to do some medicinal chemistry on this for us. So this is all very exciting, and um, I just want to thank everyone who's been involved in this project. Uh, obviously, my PI, John, who wishes that he was here, is not here. Um, but Jackie, who is here, would be happy to talk to you guys. She's going to have a poster. I think it's poster number either 13 or 14. Um, and yeah, so thank you for inviting me, and I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you for the exciting presentation. Any question, comment? Yeah, very interesting work. I, I wanted to ask you a question about one of your slides where you showed a table from 1996. Oh, sure. Like that yeah, one. Can I ask sure. you a question about that? Sure. Me, if you don't let me, mind. Let me if go back could, and find that. If you don't mind interpreting something for me. Sure. It's something I've wondered about for a while. Sure. And you may not know the answer, but that table, I think yeah, you just passed yeah. it. So, so those compounds, the first one is none, so that's 100%. Yep. <laughs> but the compounds between 16 and basically 98, those are inhibiting transport, yes. correct? Yes. And then the compounds where it's greater than 100, maybe they're enhancing transport or maybe they're just the same, right? The, yeah. They're, that is a question that I was curious about, too, when I first saw this table. Like, what does this mean when we have higher than 100%? Yes. I'm not sure if that's just yeah. random error or if it's doing something to boost expression. Yes. If it's boosting expression, then that's really cool. Because, yes. like, I don't know if someone's followed up on any of these compounds. I'm sure that they have in the 30 years since 1996, but Yes. And so let me add the second Randy part. Randy Blakely, by the way, is the one who sort of passed on this project to us. Say it one more time. Randy Blakely, the one who did this, uh, I think he first cloned this gene back in, like, the 90s. And he's the one who, when John was doing his postdoc in Chuck Sanders' lab at Vandy, um, he sort of offered John this project, basically, because no one's worked on it in a long time. Thank you. So do you think, for example, you have um, beta guanidine propionic acid. Uh -huh. Do you think that compound is being is an inhibitor or is also being transported by the channel? And same with some of the others. Do you have a thought about this? Right. So this gets back to the question about, you know, like there's all these compounds for the monoamine transporters that, you know, act as substrates. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an interesting question. I would my guess is that if they that they're just blocking the transporter, that they're acting as inhibitors, especially for these really strong ones. Whether some of these other ones can act as substrates is, I think that's very possible that some of them could be. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other question? Have you explored any alternatives to DMSO for delivering the drug? Because I know one thing DMSO can do is induce pores and membranes, which might be the... That's, that's good to know. Yeah, <laughs> at yeah. high concentrations, it yeah. can be lethal. Which makes yeah. sense, right? It's, it's how it's able to deliver a lot of compounds into cells. But that's a question kind of for Jackie and John. <laughs> any other question? No, oh, Jackie's no, going to address yeah, that. Comments, okay. So, Really quick, the question for the DMSO. Uh, this goes back to enamine being in Ukraine and having more options as to how you receive the drugs. And we weren't really given an option. There is solubility issues with some of these. Um, he calculated the log P scores. The one universal solvent that they could all go into was DMSO. So we start there. Down the road, if you have a lead drug, you're then going to work with the formulation specialist to get it into something else, ideally. 
Uh, but this is also why we use DMSO as the control and normalize everything to DMSO because uh, it needs to have an effect above that. So yeah, you're absolutely right. We just weren't necessarily given an option on these ones when they were sourced. Hi, Chuck and Jackie. Thank you so much. Um, that was beautiful. Uh, I have a couple different questions, uh, but I'll start with one and then we'll go further. Um, you know, going back to what uh, Dr. Lipschutz sa said, um, with the inhibitors binding to the outward facing conformation, have you observed, particularly with your methods, cycling or down regulation after treating with an inhibitor? I don't think that we've, we don't really have um, a measure that could look at that yet. Now, we are collaborating with um, Sylvia Stockler, and I think that Peter, who you guys work with, I know, have tools where they can, they can do patch clamp. And I think with patch clamp, you can examine questions like this. But you're doing patch, right? Are you doing patch? We use flow cytometry, right? Did you not see it internalize? Oh. So, okay. Oh, yeah, you see. So in this, you would see the transporter internalized. You wouldn't see the drug internalized. No, but if right. if you treat with the inhibitor and yes. then you see internalization, yes, that is probably what that implies. Oh, it's sort yes. of control. Right. Yeah. So I would, my answer to you, would be yes as of right now, um, but I haven't tried. I haven't tagged them in a time dependent manner necessarily to absolutely confirm this. We dose everything for sixteen hours before preparing for our flow cytometry. But uh, last year when I gave a talk, I had the initial screening of which ones increased protein, total protein, and I thought I had five or six leads from that. And then from tagging the membrane bound versus the internal, I was very surprised in the past few weeks with getting all the data and analyzing it. Some, and Chuck showed one of these in the bar graphs, that one, we have a boost in total protein, however, it's internal. There is a lot more internal than was expected, and those numbers are much higher than what we see with our controls, which would almost start to indicate that it is being endocytosed and pulled back inside, because you have this total increase, but if the membrane bound is still the same and not increasing, and it's all inside, then um, yeah, that would kind of be the indication of that. It's gonna take some more work to absolutely confirm that, but. Yeah, and amphetamine, for example, can definitely promote internalization of the dopamine transporter, for example. Um, one follow-up question, maybe more of a future thought than current. Um, is there a way for you to integrate some of the, the wet lab data that you have, right? So you're, you have a bunch of, we were basically moving down the direction of like generative AI-based approaches and recursive screening, right? So if you are able to uh, rank order the compounds that increase by potency, that increase uh, expression, and also you know compounds that are probably well tolerated based on log p values and the like, could you input those back and find newer scaffolds? Doing that. Absolutely. That's yeah. that's one of the things that Aretha is working on. Yeah, that is. That that's in our pipeline. We are going there. We do, as Chuck said, we do have some variants. Um, and you know, it wasn't feasible for me as one person to test 50 compounds against 30 variants all at once. So once we narrow it down to some that we know are good and not toxic and just killing the cells in their entirety, right? Uh, then you kind of move forward with those starting to structure activity, starting to a secondary screening um, and to keep going. This is not a stop process. This is a we're changing paths and we're still moving with it. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> uh, awesome talk, Chuck. Uh, yeah, so the, the compound that you found, it's, it's super interesting. And do you think that, you know, even though most compounds that bind to the interface, um, you know, might not stabilize it, the hope was, the design was to stabilize it, to get it to, to um, chaperone out. And do you, do you think that that might um, cause it to gain an inhibitory activity? And therefore, do you, when you do your transporter assay, are you doing it in the presence of the compound? So I think the compound is washed off, right, Jackie? So when you did the reuptake assay, the, the timing of when you do the treatment versus when you measure reuptake and add creatine to the cells, that's different. That, Jackie will talk about that. Uh, yeah, so we dose 
I kind of thought with this internally in my head about the best way to go about this, and there's not necessarily a precedence for it that I could find, or at least very clearly that would work with the kit. So I dosed for 16 hours as I had to keep consistent as I had for the flow cytometry analysis. Then we starved them for two hours, particularly because of all the creatine in the media, and I did not have my dialyzed FBS thawed for this. It was a very last minute thing. Um, we starved for two hours in a media that should be completely devoid of that and has an increase in sodium. So I know that it should promote uh, transporter function, essentially. After that two hours, we dosed for 10 minutes, which is pretty standard for an uptake. Um, but so yeah, the DMEM and drug gets washed off during that starvation for the two hours. Dose for 10 in the starvation media, 10 minutes, and then washed again three times. And when it's washed after that 10 minutes, it is at like a ice cold kind of like four seed stop all processes, and then they are lysed and prepared for the uptake screening. So cool. So throughout the two hours is probably dissociating, and then. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping. I mean. But ultimately, we would want to do a competition assay to look at this. Yeah. And once we get further along the line, I'm, that's definitely in our bank of studies. I just wonder if you've do. even hit the ceiling for what you could see yeah. in that signal. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. It, and that's, that, that was like first try, first screening. There's definitely going to be some optimization. Uh, also, to be able to scale this to test against variants. And, um, it, you know, it was, it was a first pass on it. There's some controls that I need to add in. It has to be done in triplicate for sure, but at least I, at least we know it is not entirely inhibiting fully the uptake of creatine because that's what we don't want in any capacity. And that was, we had great increases, but it'd be awful if we saw that and then it entirely inhibited the creatine uptake. So uh, not seeing that was good news, very good news. <laughs> any other question? I was just wondering with the pool of 30 variants, is there a variety of types of variants or is it all misfold, missense? They, uh, they are not misfold, missense. And actually, we were inquiring last night um, for a list, and our boss just, I think, emailed saying, Geetha, kind of asking for a priority. I know we have some that are uh, early stop codons, we do have some that are deletions. Um, the one that Dr. Baker showed earlier, the Dell Exxon 1011, we do have that one. Um, some are missense. It, we try to have a variety and a variety of the location for where they are also, because we know that that can impact it. We're so. also not married to this collection of variants that we have, obviously. So uh, we, you know, we're we still have lots of startup funds from our move. <laughs> so we're very happy to get, you know, GeneScript to synthesize a bunch of new variants for us and do those too. Um, and so, some of them, some of them we can make. I mean, we can expand, and that's why we have reached out kind of for a priorities list because we want to make sure when we do test this, we are covering all the way across, and that it's inclusive to be representative, right, as best we can for the first set. Um, so yeah, we are taking that into consideration for the next step. Absolutely. Any other question? I'm going to pass, uh, congratulations on your work, very nice. And I'm going to pass the microphone back to Edith. Thank you all.